Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the session on uh, hydrogen production. We will be uh, looking at eight of the projects that the Clean Hydrogen JEU is funding under this pillar. My name is Nikos Limperopoulos. I'm uh, one of the project officers, and I mostly follow, I deal with projects uh, dealing with hydrogen production. And indeed, I monitor six out of the eight projects to be presented. Um, for people participating, on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see there is a menu under engagement. Please select there hydrogen production in case, and I hope you submit any uh, questions to us. Um, and then you can go back to full screen view if you wish, but to submit the questions, you need to make the screen smaller. Now, this morning we gave a very bad example as project officers. Uh, we were a bit over enthusiastic and we uh, did not follow the time limits. So I'm a bit embarrassed to ask our excellent uh, participants to try and stick with the allocated time slots in order to have an opportunity for people to um, have their questions answered. Without any further ado, I would like to invite the um, uh, Mr. Nikolaus Fleischhacker, who is one of the participating organizations, uh, the CEO of FEN Research GmbH, um, to present to us the Demo for Grid project. Nikolaus, the floor is yours. I think you are muted, Nikolaus. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, Nikolaus Fleischacker from Fen Systems and the Green Energy Center Europe. I'm glad to present to you the Demo for Grid project, which is a stands for Demonstration for Grid Services. Our project was. Uh, submitted by the consortium to the call demonstration of large scale rapid response electrolysis to provide grid balancing services and to supply hydrogen markets in 2016. And after approval, we could start the project in March 2017 and already finish it in uh, August 2023. Instead of the 16 months, we took a bit longer. It took 72 months to complete the project but now it's fully implemented. The total budget of the project was about 7.7 .7 million euro. What I will show you is even more. So we have an additional plants that uh, cost additional money. For the demo for grid, the Clean Hydrogen Partnership gave a contribution of 2.9 million euro, or at least that's the maximum contribution. And there was another financial contribution for the Swiss government of about 1.4 million euro. The consortium consists of uh, Dia de Casia from Greece. They are responsible for project management and exploitation. In Austria, it's the Codex Partners Emprise and Fence Sustain Systems from the Green Energy Center Europe. Emprise, it's a local food retailer. They are responsible for the implementation and the demonstration of the electrolyzer and FEN systems is taking care of business case development and dissemination. Technology provider was Sunfire, former IHT from Switzerland. They provided the pressurized alkaline electrolyzer. Uh, FHA from Spain um, supported with knowledge from former project, for example, early integration. And Inicom, also a Spain company, took charge of the control and command system. What were the objectives of our project? Mainly to deploy, operate, and demonstrate a beyond state of the art single stack pressurized alkaline electrolyzer under real market conditions at the production facility of Emprise. And second, to implement a business case, which is based on the provision of grid balancing services, but also capturing of attractive power price opportunities on the spot market <clears throat> and also hydropower energy sources. 
and second to also valorize this electrolytic green hydrogen in industrial and fuel cell mobile use. If you take all these objectives into account and draw them into a picture, it looks like more or less like this with uh, this demo for grid electrolyzer in the center with uh, mobility at one end and industry at another end. And this was really our vision that then came to reality. I want to show you on, at this moment <clears throat> a sh small video regarding the project. Please. A milestone in the field of hydrogen technology in Austria could be celebrated at the beginning of March 2023 at the M Price Company, together with FEN Systems. Simultaneously with the handover of the keys of the first hydrogen truck, the electrolysis plant responsible for the production of the hydrogen was handed over. As early as 2016, the initiative of the Tyrolean startup FEN Systems, based on the Green Energy Center Europe in Innsbruck, the Demo for Grid project, was brought to Tyrol as part of an EU tender in a competitive process. Initiator Ernst Fleischhacker explains the acceptance of this project worth millions. The decisive factor was that we were able to demonstrate a business case that proves that we can use the hydrogen generated from the power grid control, green hydrogen, in our own operations, in production operations, but also for logistics. The project itself is a three megawatt alkaline pressure electrolysis plant built at the M-Price Production and Logistics Center in Wels. The plant was co-financed in equal parts by the European Union and the Swiss government to the sum of around 7 million euros and is primarily used to research and demonstrate electricity grid balancing services under real operating and market condition. At the same time, it also produces green hydrogen, which is temporarily stored on site for use as needed in various industrial and logistics processes. It also supplies the fuel for the first hydrogen truck in Austria, which recently went into operation. So as you can see, most, um, most factories or uh, points from the vision came into place. Here in the background, we can see the production facility of m -Price where the electrolyzer is implemented. In the background, there is a convenience kitchen and also a butchery here on the left. On the right side, there is a bakery. And in the background, there is a cooling facility. From this production facility of m -Price, all the 250 outlets and shops are um, supplied with. And in the, as you can imagine, the system needs a lot of gas and also diesel. It's about 12 gigawatt hours of gas a year, natural gas, and 1.6 million liters of diesel a year are needed for the logistics fleet. Now we could place the demo for grid electrolyzer into the heart of this production facility and use the hydrogen produced both for production, but also for the logistics system and the mobility, use in mobility. On the left hand, you can see we introduced a hydrogen burner. I will give some more facts later on. There is also a hydrogen storage system, which can store up to 600 kilogram of hydrogen at the moment uh, that can be um, implemented or 1.7 tons can be implemented in the in the end the electrolyzer also more information later and in an additional project called high west we implemented a hydrogen truck corresponding heavy duty hydrogen refueling station one of the biggest in europe at the moment a hydrogen logistics system with containers so we can also distribute this green hydrogen in the region and a corresponding purification system that the hydrogen can also meet fuel cell rate necessities. Some more words regarding demo for grid electrolysis. 
Its nominal power 3.2 megawatt end of life. We can produce 1.3 tons of green hydrogen per day at 31 bar outlet pressure. So it's a pressurized, pressurized electrolysis plant. Temperature of operation is 80 degrees. It's possible to extract about 600 kilowatts of heat at a level of 65 degrees Celsius, which then is also used in the production facility of M-Price. The electrolysis water is purely groundwater with no drink water quality that is used for the electrolysis pro process. Really important is the balance of plant, which can provide full dynamic electro um, electrolyzer operation. And the purity of the hydrogen before gas cleaning is 99.8% by volume and after the gas cleaning meets fuel cell standards. Not directly part of the demo for grid uh, project, but part of its business case is the dual fuel burner. So hydrogen produced can also be burned and substitute natural gas. This burner was uh, manufactured by Fives Pillard, Germany. It's called Burner Pillard Lono X Flame with a thermal output of 0.275 to 1.1 megawatt. And it can both burn natural gas or hydrogen. And also it could bur can burn any mixture of hydrogen and natural gas, but this is at the moment not needed and therefore not tested. Really important with the burners is the NOx outtake. Measurements show that we are well below the legal requirements here in Austria, which are 200 milligrams of NOx per norm cubic meter. And measurements show 60 milligrams NOx per norm cubic meter. The gas supply for this dual fuel burner can be either natural gas with 0.5 bar or hydrogen with 3.7 bar. So <clears throat> as we saw from the objectives, one important thing regarding the Demo4 grid project is the business case. And then I want to take out uh, one example uh, regarding the day ahead spot market. Well, how does it work? How do uh, people from M-Price operate the electrolyzer? Basically, when there is a lot of sun in the system, energy prices drop to a low. And so um, operators from M-Price search in such a heat map for days and times of a day when electricity is, is very cheap. Uh, these power price opportunity Based on this power price opportunity, they program the electrolyzer command and control and command accordingly to operate the electrolyzer automatic, automatically when the power price opportunity starts. Then, then they produce the hydrogen until the demand is covered or the storage is full. And the hydrogen then from the storage, from the 30 bar storage, can be used either in the hydrogen burner but also via compression and the hydrogen refueling station in mobility use. At the moment, we have one hydrogen truck, the first one in Austria, in operation. But it's also possible to use a trailer filling station and su supply bulk green hydrogen. When we started with the project, uh, the idea was that the beyond of the project business case is especially the mobility, but we have some huge delays there, the next trucks are not delivered on time. And this is why the bulk supply of green hydrogen has become really important for this plant. Also, it was not foreseen that so many stakeholders actually in the area need green hydrogen, but it has become a really, uh, <clears throat> really big thing for M-Price to sell this green hydrogen. And at the moment, it uh, rose to up to one ton per of green hydrogen per day. Regarding the dissemination activities, our project <clears throat> leader said once, uh, this is really a, a plant which is suited to well disseminate and also educate hydrogen. And uh, this is really true. Alone from February to August, we had 370 visitors that were simply led by, only led by fan systems and additional people 
uh, amp price showed around all these facilities. In the same time frame, we made eight workshops really from uh, stakeholders in in uh, politics up to uh, CEOs and so on. Over the total time frame, we had about 20 publications from March till August 2023. 20, uh, and uh, the most important one in the scientific area are hydrogen in grid balancing, the European market potential for pressurized alkaline electrolysis. And the second one, establishment of Austria's first regional green hydrogen economy. economy. We were PNG High West, where demo for grid was an important part of. We also could reach 500,000 visitors on our website, in the overall project time, and it's still rising. What is the outlook regarding our project? Based on other projects, the Green Hydrogen Corridor from Munich to Bolzano, the Green Hydrogen Project at Empreis, our spearhead project, the Hydrogen Train Project in Zillertalbahn, and another project, PowerTX, Kufstein, which is uh, developed by the local yeah, power company, we want to create and establish a green local hydrogen economy. And we are now also in talks with our stakeholders and friends from Bavaria, South Tyrol, and also Trentino to further develop this. Thank you for your time and for listening to the Demo for Grid project. Thank you, Nikolaus, uh, for a very clear presentation of what you've achieved. And I know, I happen to know all the big challenges that the project faced um, in acquiring land, obtaining all the different permits to be able to build uh, close to the water stream that was passing there. And these are challenges that every project, every valley, Harrigan Valley, will eventually also be facing. And indeed, congratulations, because the facility is really a gem and indeed is becoming a focal point of uh, other hydrogen projects. Thank you very much for this. We'll move now to three short presentations from uh, covering the Anion Exchange Membrane projects that we funded. And um, usually these we present in alphabetical order. It's always been Anione, Chanel, Nueli. Well, this is now the final uh, dissemination opportunity and we're going the other way around. So we're gonna start with Nueli and I would like uh, to invite the coordinator, Mr. Aldo Gago to present. Thank you, Nikos. Um, so, uh, start sharing. Screen, entire screen. Take a bit of time. Okay, now it should work. Can, can you see? Yes, it works fine. It works fine. Okay. So my name is uh, Aldo Gago, and I'm the coordinator of uh, New Ellie. That's the next generation alkaline membrane water electrolysis with improved components and materials. I'm coming from uh, German Aerospace Center, uh, DLR. So here you can see some uh, facts about the project. So it started in in 2020 in January and it finished June 2023. Uh, but as Nikos mentioned, it, we continue doing some work. Um, and most of the budget came from uh, Clean Hydrogen Partnership at that time, uh, FCGU. Uh, but we had as well a Korean partner, uh, and they had a country their own contribution of almost four thousand. Uh, Euro. You can see here the partners uh, to for the time I, I cannot mention all of them, but I will mention some of them in the in other slides. So the objectives of the project uh, Newelli aims to redefine or aim it to redefine an ion exchange membrane electrolysis. So they were the main developments: uh, an ion exchange membrane and ionomers. Uh, 
highly active non-PGM catalyst and as the electrodes. So in this case, for us, what works the best was catalyst coated substrates, not catalyst coated membranes. And the final test was uh, a stack, pi cell stack with a 200 square centimeter active area uh, with the possibility of going up to 40 bar, but we, we had to change our plan during the project. And this number, the two volts at one amp per square centimeter, that's the most important uh, uh, number. So that to be quite above alkaline electrolysis and getting close to PEM electrolysis and demonstrate this in an enduring, endurance test of 2000 hours. Uh, the main achievements, so was the development of uh, uh, membranes and ionomers with a uh, high ionic conductivity. And one important outcome and unexpected was the creation of a startup company called Taylor Mem. That was a, a startup company from the partner IMCCAS from Czech Republic. And quite successful, they are now selling the membranes and ionomers. I will be happy to provide the contact uh, if, you, if someone is interested. Uh, another great achievement was uh, what was done in, in, in terms of the catalyst and electrodes. So, we uh, these the catalysts were produced by partner Senmat, and they were um, then all the academic partners were developing this CCS. And as you can see, in, in, in single cells, they could even reach a higher current densities. So, 1.5, uh, that was a bit uh, above of what we're uh, planning. The other uh, main achievement uh, and also a bit unexpected was this validation of the single cell AEM electrolysis uh, from the company Propulse. Uh, so they are selling now this cell uh, for testing uh, hardware, new membranes, new catalysts. And uh, during this validation, it was shown that where well, the materials of the partner is are stable. And this cell used the so-called hydraulic compression technology, which uses a hydraulic medium uh, to compress the cell. So it doesn't have bolts and knots. It's sort of plug and play cell. The other main achievement is, uh, well, uh, the stack. You can see there some photos of the stack. Uh, so the hydraulic media go through in between the cells to compress them uh, uniformly. Um, we started the tests. Uh, what you can see here, the red curve is the current. And on top, all these curves are the, the cell voltage. So more or less, we managed to uh, translate the performance that we were getting in the propul cell, in the single cell, to the stack. Uh, but unfortunately, at 400 hours, one cell had a problem, and that's the issue with the stack. One cell has a problem, then the whole test has to be stopped. And but we are mounting another stack, so we we are quite uh, not giving up on this and and achieve the the test we were planning. Lessons learned. Well, there were several lessons now, so the especially the the communication. Um, how the communication the partners really in, uh, was bringing a lot of be uh, benefit. So there was constant exchange of that. But uh, one lesson learned as well was the tremendous impact we had with the COVID, with the labs uh, closed. So we realized nearly, nearly in the end of the project that we needed more time for more tests uh, to validate the materials before going to the stack. Uh, uh, but that's, uh, that's how it was. Uh, regarding exploitation and expected impact. So there were several patents filed by our partner Keys, and then another partner was interested to file them. Uh, as I mentioned, there was this startup company uh, from Taylor Mem that used the developments of the projects uh, on the membranes and ionomers that they did. And the other important exploitation was, well, this uh, single cell from partner Propulse which became a product 
basically. And it's available now for any, and I know they've been selling that a lot in, for, in Europe. Uh, and the impact, well, definitely there was a cost reduction in the capex of the electrolyzer. Uh, from some uh, analysis was uh, shown that cost analysis that the sta sta stainless steel and peak, of course, peak is very expensive material, are dominating the, the cost. Uh, but also our, our partner, Ellie Kid made an LCA. Uh, they showed that electricity, electricity cost still being the dominant uh, factor for producing the green hydrogen. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you, the Clean Hydrogen Partnership, for funding this project. Thanks. Thank you, Aldo, for all the very good work that uh, you have been doing and your perseverance to keep on testing after the end of the project. <laughs> and I appreciate you will also be reporting in trust yeah. uh, next year. Excellent. Thanks. Let me remind people that are following, uh, you're welcome to submit your questions. Please also indicate to which of the speakers or the projects you want to uh, your question be answered. Let's move now to uh, Project Chanel, and I would like to invite uh, Dr. Luis Colmares Rauseo to give his presentation. Luis, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Nico, for the kind introduction. I hope that you all see my full screen now. Yes, it is fine. Good. Yes, uh, thank you for the invitation. I will present the main uh, outcome from the project uh, channel, which is, uh, uh, Nico says, is one of the, uh, the three projects dedicated to the development of anion exchange membranes. My name is Luis Colmenares de Rousseau. I work in the battery hydro technologies group in synthesis industry in Trondheim, uh, Norway. So the project uh, is had a duration of three and a half year, starting in early 2020 and finalized the last uh, summer. We have a total budget around 2 million, all of those 100% funded by the Clean Hadron Partnership. As you can see uh, here in the slide, we were six uh, project uh, partners or participants, the Norwegian uh, University of Science and Technology in Norway, us in synthesis coordinators, the University of Norway uh, related to the development of the hydrogen evolution uh, catalyst. We had colleagues from the Fortune Central Julish in charge of the uh, oxygen evolution catalyst uh, development, single cell testing together with synthesis. Um, Ebonic, a uh, membrane on ionomer developer, enacted as um, gathering all the materials developing in the uh, prototype uh, stack and shell as um, guidance for the end user applications. So the project uh, channels was based in the experience from the, all the uh, six, five different uh, partners. Our starting point was based on the state of the art AM membrane ionomer from Evonik and previous experience in national uh, projects granted uh, related to the development of no PGM hydrogen evolution, oxygen evolution uh, catalyst done in uh, uh, Julish, also at the universities of, uh, here in Trondheim uh, and the new. Also with the high experience of everyone knows about the ENACTA related to the AEM water electrolysis technology, together with some uh, competence that we have here for the development of the flow field bipolar plate related to the stat design. Based on this background, all of the partners come out with um, an optimization and uh, improvement of those uh, states of their uh, materials. We focus uh, mainly in the optimization of the uh, CQA, PHEK polymer from, uh, from Ebonic, further optimization of the, of the manufacturing uh, and synthesis of these uh, uh, membranes, polymers, and ionomers. We focus on optimizing uh, uh, also the nickel-based uh, materials, nickel molybdenum, and nickel iron, looking at the high performance, but also looking at to suitable or uh, scalable synthesis procedures. We also uh, had some targets related to the performance of the, of the MEA, approaching uh, 
values or that we are uh, computing. Also, we uh, looking at to design and um, pressure electrolyzer uh, chart stack. Combining all these uh, individual objectives, our main target was to demonstrate a uh, state of the art two kilowatt uh, AM water electrolyzers operating at 30 bars with a performance about uh, 1.85 volt uh, 1 amp uh, per square centimeter. The idea was to to test that uh, prototype about 2000 hours we let the 50 millivolts uh, degradation loss that's what the target unfortunately not all of those were uh, achievable but uh, we had a lot of learning uh, during the development of uh, of this prototype so in the membrane development i know development as i say we are starting in the state of the art um, um, material from the uh, from Ebonic. We have an um, optimization uh, loop where we have uh, about three generations of this membrane ionomer uh, with intention to achieve mainly all the related KPI uh, or properties that those membranes should have. Uh, during that process, we learn a lot about it's not only uh, the point to achieve the KPI, exit of KPI for those membranes important, of course, the ion conductivity, uh, the ion exchange uh, properties, but also we need to learn about the durability, chemical durability, uh, and also the durability of the membrane on their operation in order to have a better understanding of the degradation process that can, uh, this uh, polymer have. Um, basing on that knowledge, we can really optimize and improve the uh, physical chemical properties of these uh, materials. Our partner Ebony uh, was uh, improving the competence in order to manufacture those membrane, providing different size and thickness, but nevertheless, the more crucial, uh, as we learned during these three and a half years of the project, was the durability of the, of the membrane. In terms of the, of the catalyst development, we achieved our uh, targets related to those. Uh, both uh, hydrogen evolution or evolution catalyst characterizing ex situ uh, shown a um, uh, good performance compared with the state of the art nickel nickel uh, oxide refer materials, also referred to platinum as a uh, PGN refer material in terms of the hydrogen uh, evolution. Um, we also uh, developed and optimized those materials not only related to the chemical composition but also related to the, uh, the effect of the ionomer content also related to the um, concentration of the hydroxide in the, in the supporting electrolyte. So we go through a different uh, weight percent of the ionomer related to the catalyst, um, monitoring the activity of those catalysts and specific current density in order to identify the threshold related to the content of the ionomer. Um, the same was done on a specific ionomer content on catalyst loading related to the performance at different uh, concentration of the KOH. So having this overall picture, we optimized the, I will say, the procedure, the recipe to prepare inks of those uh, materials to be transferred uh, to the manufacturing of the CCS and be integrated in a single cell test. The learning that we take from here is that still a lot of to understand what is the role of the ion exchange ionomer and the catalyst, the interaction between both, especially the optimization of the, this radio, a function of the hydroxide concentration of the supporting electrolyte. Also, during the manufacturing of the catalyst layer, we need to keep in mind or thought that the high activity that this catalyst may have is correlated to high loading content. And then this uh, architecture or engineering of the catalyst layer had to be optimized in order to minimize mass transport constraints. Again, a similarity that we learned in the membrane development, it uh, will be ideal to try to learn uh, what are the degradation process, what are the activities, uh, dominant uh, mechanisms by uh, monitoring in situ or in operando uh, the catalyst stability and activity. Related to the integration, all these uh, materials have been developed before, we were able to achieve the channel target, 
We have um, uh, long-term operative single cells with um, performance of uh, 185 volts at one ampere per square centimeter at one molar KOH. The single cell also was testing similarly to the exit test with the catalyst, was tested at different concentrations of KOH, where we had able to uh, achieve uh, um, also have even better performance with concentration around 1.5 molar KOH. We also was investing a lot of time into look at the reproducibility of those catalyst layers, as I mentioned before, looking at the constraints related to the content of the ionomer and the concentration of the supporting electrolyte. Uh, we actually to have a reproducible procedure to fabricate these uh, electrodes and to have a stable performance uh, about more than 1,000 hours with a minimal loss of the voltage. Uh, side of that, I don't present too much here, but we also was uh, in process, we were developing um, an ionic shell membrane water electrolysis model to predict local effect like pH change, water concentration gradient, and so on. Uh, we hope at uh, some point that we can publish that result, uh, which I am not presenting today here. Finally, uh, after an optimization at the single cell level related to the catalyst layer, we face issues in our prototype two kilowatt stack. One of those was related to the sizing of the membrane and catalyst layer. Our target was initially to have 100 square centimeters a, a active area for each uh, cell. But unfortunately, there was some constraint related to, to the dimensioning of the membrane. And we adapted the, this procedure uh, to, to have a 64 square centimeters um, surface area per cell uh, with 16, uh, 16 cells in order to achieve the two kilowatt uh, uh, stack prototype. We got through all the design of the prototype, flow fields, bipolar play, with a lot of learning in that case. We need to say that uh, an app that uh, was pretty much involved in this uh, uh, R&D stack prototype. We don't use the commercial available uh, stack prototypes that they have. Rather than that, we was focusing on developing uh, the channel prototype. Unfortunately, uh, after the almost 300 hours of operation, um, the stack fails due to mainly mechanical um, failures, also damage or so three or four cells during the ensembling process and the initial uh, characterization process. If you want to learn more about all the materials developing uh, during the channel project, uh, I invite you to look at uh, our different um, um, publications. Uh, so far was five publications uh, related to the development optimization of the catalyst. Um, there are two more coming from our colleague from the Fortune Center, Julius. Our result was presenting in more than 10 conference. Uh, I need to highlight that our partner from NTNU applied for a patent related to the hadron evolution uh, catalyst that they developed in the frame of the channel. And in collaboration, actually how uh, Nikos mentioned it initially, in collaboration with Neule Anion, we had a close cooper cooperation. We create this AN hub to promote the AN water electrolysis technology. But besides that, we have a couple of the workshop, the technical workshop that is very interesting for Tifolo, where we try to harmonize, standardize the procedure, how we assess and evaluate the material development, the single cell testing, uh, and learning from, from that to try to, to optimize, harmonize all those in order to be able to compare result along or across different projects related with the same uh, technology. To finalize, uh, I just highlight here the main achievement that our, our project have. We was able to demonstrate a high performing and durable uh, NOPGM uh, AN water electrolysis uh, single cells. One of these catalysts have is, uh, applied from a patent application from our partner from Antenu. We was able to optimize and learn more about the properties at the among anion exchange membrane one anion exchange ion number should have in order to be integrated in the in the stack. Uh, we optimize all our development is um, in a high performing single cell. Unfortunately we failed to demonstrate a long term stacked prototype, but we had um, a huge learning for that process. Saying that I want to thank you to the Clean Hadron Partnership for, for the support and to all the colleagues uh, participating in channel project. And thank you to you all for your attention.
Thank you, Luis, for your uh, very nice presentation, presenting your um, achievements uh, in material component development and the challenges when bringing all these into a short stack level. Um, and I think it's something we saw in all three projects, the, the challenge once you, you go to a real stack testing. Um, we will go straight away to the third and final uh, nine exchange membrane vectorizer project, Project Anione. I would like to invite Antonine Arico, Antonino Arico to give his presentation. Nino, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nikos, for uh, your kind invitation. Um, my presentation is dealing with, with the Anione project. An ion exchange membrane electrolysis for hydrogen production on uh, on a wide scale. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, it is perfect. Okay, thank you. So, um, regarding the project overview, uh, this project was presented for the cold year 2019, and uh, the involved partners are um, essentially CNR ITE as a project coordinator, CNRS and, uh, and Hydrolyte involved in membrane uh, manufacturing, especially reinforced membrane development. And uh, TFP uh, was dealing with uh, catalyst scaling up, IRD fuel cells with uh, MEA manufacturing, and hydrogenics that was acquired by Cummins during the project um, running period. Uh, has developed the AM electrolysis stack and the uni research has assisted with uh, um, dissemination and exploitation. Uh, regarding the uh, project summary, um, I will say that this project was essentially uh, um, addressing the objective, the overall objective to develop a an cost-effective an ion exchange membrane water electrolysis technology and we have essentially focused on non-critical raw materials for the catalyst and for the membrane. And we have, at the end of the project, focused on hydrocarbon membranes operating in, a, in an environment with diluted KOH. And the innovative solutions that were developed in the project were validated in a 2 kilowatt AM electrolysis stack with a hydrogen production capacity of about 0 0.4 normal cubic meter hydrogen per hour. Now, regarding the membrane, uh, at the beginning of the project, uh, we uh, addressed the development of different approaches, including perfluorinated membranes. But at the end of the project, we focused on hydrocarbon membranes, and the results have been published in, in, some, uh, uh, in some papers on uh, international journals. Regarding the single cell performance, we have achieved uh, two amperes square centimeter at about two volts, single cell voltage. Uh, and at one ampere square centimeter, we have achieved about slightly above 1.8 volts per cell. I have to say that uh, this AM technology, there is still a gap between the performance of AM electrolysis and PEM electrolysis, about 300 milliwatt, uh, milli, millivolt at 2 amperes square centimeter. But uh, it is also important to emphasize that this technology is based on non-critical raw materials, essentially nickel, nickel iron, nickel molybdenum based electrocatalysts and hydrocarbon membrane. And especially we don't use any titanium because in this case, nickel and stainless steel are used for the uh, uh, stack hardware. Another important aspect, we can achieve good hydrogen purity with extremely high paradigm efficiency. Regarding the durability of the developed components, we have, uh, we have carried out durability tests exceeding 2,000 hours. Uh, of course, there were several startup shutdown cycles, and we have observed reversible losses, um, but still the um, uh, durability is, is uh, uh, let's say, 
in line with our expectation that there is a, some decrease of paradigm efficiency by the end of the test. And also the system is uh, appropriate for dynamic operation. Regarding the stack, starting with the large area MEA manufacturing, uh, also in this project, the best approach was uh, 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 catalyst coated the substrate that is was more practical and uh, uh, IRD have uh, manufactured something like 25 MEAs uh, that were assembled into the um, uh, AM electrolysis stack developed by Hydrogenics uh, and uh, uh, of course it is was uh, tested also at mild pressure and I have to say that for the stack, the performance was slightly lower. Uh, we got uh, 2.1 volts per cell at one ampere square centimeter. That is uh, at an operating current, uh, total current of 100 ampere at a 50 degrees Celsius with a recirculation of one mole of KOH. Uh, this uh, essentially uh, um, translate into Oh, a voltage efficiency of 71%, uh, about uh, um, approaching uh, 99 and 97% Faraday efficiency, and the total uh, energy efficiency was approaching 70%. That was uh, indeed different from the, uh, um, let's say, um, objective we had in the grant agreement. But uh, uh, of course, um, there are uh, we have individuated some approaches to improve this performance, but I have to say that these uh, all these components were validated into this two kilowatt stack, showing also uh, appropriate uh, durability at least for 250 hours. Uh, regarding the challenges, I have to say that uh, we need to address gas crossover um eventually uh, improving our uh, reinforce the membranes and also introducing a recombination catalyst at the anode uh, it is important that, of course to to keep low the hydrogen content in the uh, anode stream and another important aspect is uh, improving operation at high pressure we have essentially operated the stack at mild pressure uh, regarding the synergies with other projects and programs, uh, as already mentioned by, by our uh, colleagues of the other projects, uh, we have developed together, all together, the so-called AEM Hub. So we have collaborated strongly with the newly and Chanel projects and, uh, of course, organized several joint um, uh, webinars and also workshop in presence, also with the support of the Clean Hydrogen JU and also support of JRC. And with this, I have concluded. I would like to thank the Clean Hydrogen JU for the uh, support and all of you for uh, your kind attention. Thank you very much, Nino, for being also very much on time. We have a few questions uh, that would be nice to answer them at the end. And once more, I would like to thank all three projects for being so open and collaborating for the uh, testing protocols you jointly developed for developing the Anon Exchange Membrane uh, Web Hub. Uh, I can share that uh, the projects even shared among them experts in uh, when the midterm evaluation of the projects came along. You know, they were they were so open, uh, so collaborative. It's a small community uh, that uh, helped uh, each other. And I think the uh, sector is now going to grow fast. Let's move now to a different type of electrolyzer. Let's go to increase the temperatures. Um, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Julie Mouguin, the coordinator of the Reflex project to give her presentation. Julie, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Nikos, for your kind uh, introduction. I hope you can see my screen full screen. Yes, it's perfect. Perfect. So I will indeed present the Reflex project that deals with reversible solid oxide electrolyzer and fuel cell for optimized local energy mix. So I'm Julie from CA in France. 
So the project has um, started in 2018 and um, ended a few months ago. Um, it gathered nine partners from all around Europe in six countries. And you will see afterwards that we were covering the whole value chain from the sales to the systems. And we had a total budget and funding for about 3 million euros. Even if in the end, uh, especially for the system integration, the final cost was a little bit higher. So uh, the main objective of the project was to develop an innovative renewable energy storage solution called Smart Energy Hub. And this solution was based on what we call the reversible solid oxide cell technology. The core technology is a ceramic cell which uh, several of them are assembled into a stack. And the specificity of this technology is that it can operate either in electrolysis mode or fuel cell mode. And if you combine both modes, you can have something which is reversible and can really store and release um, electricity that you can have in excess at some point and uh, to, to, to reproduce um, um, electricity when you are lacking of. Uh, this technology operates at 700 degrees C, that is why it's a ceramic, and its main advantages is that it is flexible, as you could see, electrolysis and fuel cell. It has a very high efficiency in all modes, and it is what we call fuel flexible. It means especially in, a, in fuel cell mode, you can operate with hydrogen, but also other fuels like natural gas. The second objective of the project was to demonstrate in field the high power to power round trip efficiency of this technology as a comparison with other hydrogen based solution and also to prove its flexibility and durability in dynamic operation, which is mainly power transient and switch between electrolysis and fuel cell mode. The Smart Energy Hub has been installed in an acti activity park that is called SLS Acti Park in France. And um, the final um, application uh, targeted uh, for the project was uh, to install this kind of system in eco buildings or eco districts in order to maximize their renewable energy consumption. So what did we achieve? Let's start first with sales and stack performances. We intended to reach a, par um, a power dens uh, um, current density of 1.2 amp per square centimeter in electrolysis mode at the thermoneutral voltage of 1.3 volt and 0.6 amp per square centimeter in fuel cell mode at 0.8 volt with a pretty high fuel utilization in both cases above 85%. And we developed specific cells for that, that we call generation two cells. And you could see from the curves here that we reached those targets uh, with this generation two cells. And we also successfully upscaled the cells from button cells to 200 square centimeters, and we integrated those cells into stacks. And on the right hand side, you see um, the different stacks that have been manufactured for integration into the Smart Energy Hub. 16 stacks have been manufactured uh, with a pretty low scattering, and they also confirm the improvement of performance that we got with the generation two cells. Now then durability. So we intended to decrease quite a lot the degradation of uh, this technology as compared to state of the art to go below 2% per 1000 hour in electrolysis mode. On the left hand side, you see uh, the durability obtained in reversible mode. Electrolysis is here and fuel cell is here. And uh, we, after an initial high degradation, I would say, we succeeded to get a low degradation with the generation to cells um, by this cycling effect, even if we still observed, as generally reported, that the degradation was higher in electrolysis mode than in fuel cell mode. More or less the same trend was obtained on stacks, as you could see here. Uh, but after, let's say, uh, 6, 600 hours, the degradation rate in electrolysis mode was decreasing quite a lot to, re to become almost flat. But with uh, quicker cycles, daily cycles that you can see here, 
we found some thermal effects that can also change the voltage and make the evaluation of durability a little bit more tricky. And last part, the smart energy hub operation. So we intended to be able to operate it with a pretty high power modulation that we succeeded to achieve in three modes. Uh, in electrolysis, we had the power modulation between 58 and 100 percent. And in fuel cell mode, you could see the two modes with pure hydrogen between 23 and 100 uh, percent and in uh, natural gas between 13 and 100 percent. So it has been observed, obtained here at the stack level and it has been defined as a set point for the system. So we started to uh, build one single module gathering four stacks and this single module have been started first and it has been operated for more than 5,600 hours, gathering all the individual testing campaigns that we did with more or less 3,300 hours in electrolysis or fuel cell mode and more than 135 cycles between electrolysis and fuel cell modes. So the project has been ended, but um, to the, the testing will continue beyond the end of the project by the addition of the other module to operate the modules together and combined. So risks and lesson learned. So we expected that we could have some delay in some tasks that could be particularly critical for testing, manufacturing, and uh, I have to say also due to the COVID crisis, but not only, it has, it has occurred. And um, we tried to, let's say, minimize this risk by paral parallelizing some tasks and rescheduling the overall project planning. And that's one of the reasons why we asked for an extension and why we also started to test with an, only one single module. We also faced some regulatory issues with the integration into the demonstration site. At the beginning, we should install the system in Italy, but it was uh, more difficult, I would say, to install this kind of system in Italy than in France. So that is why we decided to change the demonstration site. Um, and in terms of, let's say, scientific challenges and technical challenges, we found that the thermal management by switching between the electrolysis and fuel cell mode and power modulation could be an issue. And we resolved it by, the, uh, by performing extensive modeling tasks to uh, support the system design. And um, we also faced, as I said in introduction, higher costs. That is the reason why we decreased the number of modules from three to two, and we changed the demonstration site. Um, for the exploitation, we had a chance on, in the project to have partners on the world value chain, um, Elcogen for the cell, GP Tech for the power electronics, and Silfen for the system integration. And finally, NG as an end user company in charge also of uh, techno-economic and life cycle assessment. Uh, that was for the industrial players, and it was supported by the academic and research uh, organization that were performing some, um, let's say, testing, modeling, and so on, which was very helpful to support the product uh, developments. Um, we also succeeded in the project to identify promising markets by evaluating different countries and different applications, and it has been found that before 2025, the technology could already be competitive in some cases, especially in Germany and Italy, for offices and shopping centers, if we compare it with battery and uh, buildings with no PV. And uh, here you can see the curve of the product price decrease forecast, which is expected over the years from now to, uh, let's say, 2030. And you could see that, especially due to the market size and the product maturity increase by the partner, we could reach a low uh, cost that could um, allow to reach the targets that we defined and that the company defined. Finally, for the communication activities, we participated to 13 conferences, 20, 15 articles, more than 10,000 visitors on the website. We also promoted a large dissemination to general public, and we uh, organized a closing event 
where it was possible to visit the site and uh, we gathered more or less 200 people that came to visit the system. There was politics and uh, st different stakeholders that came to this event. And we also had an international advisory board that was very effective in order to promote our techno-economic assessment. And to finish, I would like to display a quick movie of the site preparation and system integration on site. from the movie that uh, the old site has been completely um, repurposed and uh, all the facilities that were necessary to bring the gases, the safety and whatever has been put in place before installing the system that you can see right now with the different modules. So that's all for the movie. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Uh, that's one more of the projects I've been following and I know how much effort, commitment uh, has gone to this project, producing very good results, uh, developing eventually an impressive facility to test and demonstrate the system. And I also know that um, one of the beneficiaries, beneficiaries Silfen, is really committed to coming up with a commercial product eventually. And that is also very important that you'll be continuing in uh, testing. Thank you. So let's uh, drop the temperatures a bit from 700 down to 60, 70 degrees, but maybe even minus 20 because we are moving to the northernmost tip of Norway, where the um, next project is located. I would like to invite uh, Federico Zenit to present Project EODUS. Thank you very much, Nikos. You should see the uh, slides momentarily. Each one. Perfect. Great. That's it, Nikos. So, uh, EODUS, uh, that was hydrogen eolic energy and you can guess this have had to do with wind, which optimizes upstream of substations. So we really wanted to have something that sounded like airless. So the project uh, is uh, pretty old. Uh, the call year was 2017. Um, and there was a uh, high flexible electrolyzers uh, balancing energy output inside the fence of a wind park. So very tight integration with wind production. The project was supposed to last four years. Uh, I guess everybody uh, knows what happened. We got hit very hard by COVID and we had a two year extension. We are supposed to end uh, next month. We managed to do most of the thing we planned. We had some difficulties as you can imagine. Total project budget was uh, just short of 8 million euros uh, of which five uh, provided by Brussels. Uh, we had uh, two parts from Norway, my own Sintef, Barango Craft uh, in uh, the extreme north. Uh, uh, Technalia uh, in, uh, in Spain, and then two universities, UBFC and uh, Unisign, respectively in France and uh, Italy. And then, uh, of course, uh, um, Cummins, previously known as Hydrogenics and soon to be known as Accelera in Belgium. Going ahead, so why do we go all the way to this last corner of Europe? Uh, this particular wind park, Ragovida, is uh, onshore but actually has a wonderful. Uh, um, characteristics like if it was offshore, it's a 50% um, capacity factor, where 30% usually normal, but that still they had a big concession on 200 megawatts, they could be only 45. Why? Because they didn't have the cables to send the electricity anywhere. So recently they had an extension, they reached 97 megawatts, but there's more than 100 megawatts that are unused. And the total potential in the, in the area is just an almost two gigawatt uh, for just a few thousand people living there. The local consumption is very low. There is not really any power consuming industry. Most of the industry, most of the industry is fishing. So diesel is the main form of energy being used. And uh, uh, when we decided then to, yeah, let's make some hydrogen instead with this energy so we can export that. 
we placed the electrolyzer one ton per day capacity in the harbor of Berlevog, which if you can see my point is here on the top, uh, while the wind farm is in the red circle here. This uh, has its own power line, so it's virtually inside the fence, uh, but it's also easier to access for sea and uh, road export. So in summary, uh, what did you want to do? What we managed? Uh, we definitely enabled high wind power penetration. The um, Varangakrav now has plans to build out the 200 megawatt uh, uh, concession using uh, uh, hydrogen as a case to export this energy through several ways. Demonstrating multiple use cases, sort of. Uh, we would have liked to do more experiments, uh, but there has been a lot of difficulties getting things to run. And one of the difficulties was uh, that the 2.5 megawatt uh, single stack was eventually rejected. We have two uh, stacks, uh, 1.25 megawatts, because this was even finally considered more reliable in this condition. We definitely demonstrated remote operation uh, several times. Uh, we had uh, several tests and they worked very well. And the simulation, we did plan to that uh, more on a separate slide later. So. As far as we know, this is the largest electrolyzer in uh, uh, connected directly to a wind park. Uh, happy to be um, then um, to, to be beaten uh, whenever a bigger one comes along. Uh, the accessibility is quite difficult. You can see the picture here uh, all around it. That's uh, how it is now is. Nikos came in person once. And you can also transfer the uh, solutions with the allowed to offshore wind and uh, solar in uh, remote areas. So the main application market is uh, producing hydrogen for export primarily in the long term, but also especially in the beginning for local industry. And here I would like to start the video, if possible. This is a, uh, not winter, this is a, a, actually summer, early summer. And uh, you always need to drive uh, to the car. Mountains, uh, you can see the snow starts uh, disappearing. There, you should see the village of Berlevog, uh, and this is the area that will become uh, the industrial park uh, uh, after development. These are a bit uh, old images from uh, two years ago, I believe. Uh, that uh, looks a bit different. This is our building. And uh, as we come in, uh, you see uh, the two electrolyzer stacks. They are very diminutive. You can see uh, a person on the left for comparison. They look like two fridges, but don't be fooled. Each of them has the same uh, consumption as the entire village. There you see some fuel cells, about 100 kilowatt. And we also had uh, a Mirai park there. Um, we couldn't fuel the, it back then, but uh, next year, hopefully, a fueling station will be available. More on that later. Yes, back to the presentation. Thank you. So, uh, what have we achieved? Um, one of the um, key um, performance indicator was uh, efficiency and um, we are at those 52 kilowatt hours per kilogram. That was uh, already achieved by Cummins. The cost, uh, we can say it's uh, also achieved. We had an internal target of uh, 3 million uh, euros. We got to 2.5 million euros per ton per day. It's actually quite nice since a 2.5 megawatt. So it's uh, exactly 1 million per megawatt at this point. 
in the meantime, technology has also advanced. Um, targets that did not go so well uh, was optimizing the cold and hot study. This is not something really you can do when you have your technicians half a continent away. So this one uh, is something that should be addressed in some other project. Uh, we tried to, to um, do something, but it was not systematic enough, and this part is not uh, very satisfactory. Degradation uh, was also not so easy to handle because we didn't have that uh, much uh, operating data. But uh, thanks to Cummins, who have been uh, um, able to provide historical data, our partner UBFC is also analyzing this data and will provide a report by the end of uh, this year. In terms of uh, uh, control uh, cases and monitoring, um, this uh, has been uh, mostly achieved. Uh, we are only missing the uh, dynamic simulation that uh, takes over from the long-term demonstration that was not, not possible. And this will be done in the final months of the project. In terms of uh, dissemination, all public reports uh, are uh, have been published and they're all available on our website, heilus.eu. So if you're interested in any of these, please go there and uh, download. In terms of what we learned, well, we learned a lot. Um, obviously, we had uh, COVID-19, and one of the problems was that our main partner for uh, hardware, Cummins, is located in Belgium, which means uh, when uh, borders closed there, um, that was a significant problem because a lot of their, um, their partners were from maybe Germany, maybe France, and suddenly they could not uh, work together anymore. Uh, on top of that, the partner uh, and SME we had together that did a lot of good work has went bankrupt uh, last year. We managed uh, to get the, their software out of uh, of the quagmire. Now it's open source, so this changed a bit the exploitation. Instead of selling software licenses, we'll um, start an open source uh, project. In terms of safety, we are happy to report there have been no accidents during constructions. We had uh, one uh, event uh, during commissioning with the hydrogen leak on the, on the outside that, that was uh, not a significant problem, was uh, fixed immediately. And we had a, one curious false alarm during operation. They had put uh, a uh, fire sensor on the north side of the building because the north side will not be directly in the sun. The problem is uh, we are so far north here that we have midnight sun and the midnight sun shines from the north. So. One day at 2 a.m., uh, alarms rang all across Europe because uh, it seemed that, that the thing was exploding. Of course, uh, nothing in the solar was happening, just the sun, the midnight sun was shining on the sensor. And that's all that happened. There are significant exploitation plans. Uh, Varanga Craft is building, and that's a picture from a couple of months back. They're building uh, the foundations for a filling station. And that would be both for um, trucks, uh, containers, uh, and bundles. They have identified a number of uh, customers. There is a biogas plant in a neighboring municipality, um, telecommunication, base stations, uh, even armed forces, lighthouses, uh, and so on. They're all interested in starting using hydrogen. In the longer perspective, uh, you want to start uh, filling fishing boats with hydrogen instead of diesel. There's also possibility of having a passenger ferry in the region uh, and trucks. Uh, there's a lot of trucks that are carrying fish uh, down to Europe. And the idea of having zero emission fish apparently is something that uh, can be exploited in marketing. Um, there's significant focus on uh, green ammonia. And uh, uh, this uh, idea of Berlovog Industrial Park is uh, one of the ideas for revitalizing the local economy. And uh, this uh, forces uh, a significant scale up of electrolyzer. Uh, there's talk of 100 megawatts of electrolyzers that when will produce hydrogen, use the in production of green ammonia, which then can be sold uh, as fuel for uh, long range ships. And of course, we had a lot of dialogue with the local authorities, especially the County Council of Troms and Finnmark. The simulation activities, uh, we definitely uh, overdid our targets. Uh, we have uh, currently seven journal articles with more down the pipeline, in fact. Over 30 contribution conferences, uh, the winner seminars, uh, dedicated workshop to conference, uh, internships uh, on site, which uh, being the site so far was a bit difficult uh, <laughs> to find some students willing to go all the way there. Uh, on site inauguration uh, in total 16 public reports. And the last one is a booth industrial fair. If anybody is in Augsburg, Germany, 7th and 8th December, or anywhere near there, it's close to Munich. Please come visit us at the Off Grid Expo. And that's it. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Federico. Thank you for all the good uh, work that uh, Eulus has been doing over all these years. Really very many challenges, like you said, and in particular, these were magnified by the very remote and cold location that allowed any work uh, to be done for very few months uh, of the year. Um, nice to hear about zero emission fish. I think that goes very well with the zero emission bread that is produced under the Demo for Grid uh, project at uh, the M price, or baked and distributed eventually. We'll have a partnership for a zero emission sandwich. Indeed, let's go for that. And especially if you produce zero emission uh, ammonia, you could provide this as a fertilizer so that the complete cycle would be zero emission. Uh, right, now we are indeed running a bit late, so let's now move ahead to our last presenter, Ms. Marie-Laure Fontaine, to present two projects, uh, Projects Gamer and Winner. Marie-Laure, the floor is yours. Hello, could you please confirm that you can see the slide? Yes, perfectly. Very good. So the first project is called GAMER, which stands for Game Changer in High Temperature Steam Electrolyzer uh, with a spin uh, in the fact that we are, for this specific electrolyzer technology, focusing on tubular cell and stack uh, geometry for pressurized hydrogen production. The project is uh, uh, also a bit uh, older. It started in 2018 and it finished in 2022. It has approximately 3 million euros budget and the partners are listed here. Sintef was the coordinator for the project and we have a, a partnership with Carbon Recycling International in Iceland, CCIT ITQ in Spain. Kurstek Membrane Science in Norway, University of Oslo in Norway, MC2 Engineering Systemas in Spain, and Shell uh, Global International PV in the Netherlands. So the main objective for this project was to demonstrate the concept of high temperature steam electrolysis using this time a proton conducting ceramic electrolyte um, to extract hydrogen uh, in a dry manner and to be able to obtain it in a pressurized uh, mode uh, from the electrolyzer itself. So you have a tiny schematic here, which I'm sure you cannot read, but basically the water uh, is split uh, on one side um, in the form of oxygen, which is then released. Uh, hydrogen is uh, then um, extracted through ionic transport via the electrolyte and it's then released on the negative side, as we call it. Um, because we have this selective hydrogen uh, um, extraction from this electrolyte, from this cell concept, we are able to operate the cell at high pressure and generate directly pure dry um, pressurized hydrogen. This is a fairly um, young uh, technology. It's uh, uh, compared to all the other one, especially the solid oxide electrolyzer cell, which are uh, very much uh, mature. And uh, therefore, the concept with this first project was to develop uh, different scales. First, uh, novel tubular cells, which enables to carry out this uh, pressurized extraction, define what we would uh, call as repeating units to be integrated in a stack and uh, also defines the system in which we could integrate potentially a 10 kilowatt uh, stack to be able to carry out uh, such a demonstration. In addition to designing, therefore, the cells, the stack and the system in one go, we also worked on uh, evaluating what kind of technology um, assessment, what kind of technology integration uh, should we consider when we utilize this type of electrolyzer in terms of how to integrate our hydrogen, possibly with thermal en uh, energy in various plants. And the plants that we have selected were based on the collaboration with the partner that we have with the project, so namely Shell and Carbon Recycling International. So it was a methanol plant and a refinery. And we have also some uh, advisory board members uh, in uh, Yara and Air Liquid, which also enable us to do technology integration assessment for uh, chemical plants, like ammonia production. So 
I am showing here uh, a little bit of highlights uh, on the, from the result of this project. This figure shows the achievements that we have uh, established when it comes to designing the single repeating unique or the basic cell, the stack configuration, uh, and then the system where we have integrated the Oakbox into a containerized solution. So just quickly, a uh, quick run through. The, our base cell is a tubular cell, which is integrated here. The tubular cell is approximately 20 centimeter length. It's integrated in a steel vessel. And with this integration, we call uh, this unit a single engineering unit. So this enables us to have pressurized operation in each individual cell up to 20 bar. These cells or single engineering unit, we have chosen to design them into a stack panel to be able to build up uh, the, the current and the capacity. So one stack panel consists of 16 of such uh, single uh, uh, units, SEUs. The stack panel uh, um, is schematically represented here. It has all the manifolds uh, for handling the gas and uh, the currents. The stack panel are then integrated in what we call the hotbox, which provides uh, uh, heat, at least at the startup. The hotbox has been designed to integrate up to 16 panels. So if you count, you have 16 by 16 SCUs to get approximately to eight kilowatts. Uh, the two other kilowatts are from the balance of plant of the system. And the system has been designed, uh, here you see the PNID, uh, it has been designed as a containerized solution. Uh, it's a 20 foot container where we have two zones, the attack zone where the uh, hot box is located and where you can see the little, uh, the little person to give you a size idea. And we have a zone, a separated zone for all the control, uh, uh, the system control of the plant. The plant is designed uh, self-standing, so uh, it also contains uh, steam generation, the gas, uh, gas removal and so on and so forth. So this is how it looked like in picture, just to show you that uh, we have gone um, through the uh, step by step through the realization of this plant. This is the stack before we integrated all the thermal insulation and the different copper bar and everything to do the manifolding and the current distribution and collection. And you have here a picture of the outside of the container, which has been located at CSIC in Spain and uh, several views of the hot box and the test station. So that was when we were doing the commissioning. Um, uh, just to say quickly that this has been a difficult uh, uh, moving ahead um, because we had to face uh, innovation or uh, go into an uh, unknown territory for each uh, scale upgrade from the cell to the stack, from the stack uh, from the cell to the SEU, from the SEU to the panel, from the panel to the hot box, to the panel uh, and the hot box to the system. So it has been a steep learning increase. At the end of the day, we were supposed to generate a 10 kilowatt. We did not manage to be able to furnish the system to 10 kilowatt for technical and financial reason. Uh, that was not possible. However, we were able to test two stack panel. This system is being used in a follow-up project. I will come back to that. Along this development route, we have generated very interesting learning with this technology. Um, first of all, um, looking back at our single engineering units, we have designed them in such a way that they could also be tested in individual labs. So this is how they look like. This is the cell. You can see here the steam electrode. And you have here um, um, some testing results for this single uh, engineering unit, which we have tested up to 10 bar. So it's uh, same pressure on both sides, huh, on the positron and negatron. We operate our electrolyzer at 600 de degrees Celsius or below. This is our target uh, uh, operation. And this is the corresponding surface area for one uh, uh, SEUs. This picture here shows you the set potential as a function of the current density when we operate at 3, 5, or 10 bar. And you have here the Faraday efficiency for the corresponding cells. 
just to keep it simple, the Faraday efficiency is giving you an idea of how much hydrogen you are producing from the electrons that you are sending to the electrolyzer. What you can see is that uh, there is a positive effect uh, on the Faraday efficiency when you operate the SEU at the highest temperature. And this positive effect, we have established that it is due to both an improvement of the electrode reaction, but also to the ohmic loss. And this is due because uh, we are feeding uh, more protons into our materials due to the increased pressure of steam, which then contribute at better conduction and therefore better performance. So the learning here is that inherently, <laughs> this technology has positive um, uh, efficiency increase when we are uh, increasing the, temp the pressure, which is nice. Um, I'll uh, go now towards uh, the exploitation and the impact of this project. Um, the exploitation has been multifold. Uh, we have generated uh, quite a lot of dissemination and education actions. Uh, I'm pleased to report that we have also uh, contributed to one nature material with this project, with the learning that we have generated from understanding the electrochemistry and the uh, understanding of the mechanism uh, for this type of novel cells. We have also contributed to standardization effort with the GRC towards understanding better how to operate uh, these uh, proton ceramic cells. We have generated a number of spin-off projects, and I'm going to talk to you in a few minutes about winner. And uh, also what I'm pleased to say is that we have generated some online tools which are free for use for everybody. These tools are efficiency tools which have been designed to integrate various scales, the electrochemistry, the, uh, the, the electrochemistry, the reactor design, the process efficiency. And they enables you when you have some materials and independently of your stack design to establish at a given scale uh, an idea of the expected efficiency. In terms of impact, we have progressed the technology from TRL 2.3 when we started to TRL 4.5, which, uh, which is good. And uh, we have also learned that there is possibility to utilize this cell to other applications. Which brings me to the second project, which is WINNER. And WINNER stands for, <laughs> it's a bit uh, provocative, but uh, it stands for World Class Innovative Novel Nanoscale Optimized Electrode and Electrolyte for Electrochemical Reaction. This project started in 2020 uh, with more or less the same partnership, but in addition, we uh, had uh, extended our collaboration with ALEMA and with DTU. So the project utilized the proton ceramic base cells, but here what we wanted to do is uh, instead of just revolving around steam electrolysis, we wanted to establish a platform with a simple reactor or cell configuration to be able to operate with different types of application. And the application that we have been screening is let's utilize our uh, hydrogen pump our uh, proton extraction possibility to crack ammonia to pressurize hydrogen or to power, to dehydrogenate some hydrocarbons such as ethane to produce ethylene on one side or hydrogen and hydrogen, sorry, you extract the hydrogen and then you also uh, hydrogenize your uh, ethane. And we also extended it to reversible uh, steam electrolysis. So this project had multiple uh, applications going in parallel. These are the achievements. The project is not finished, it's finishing soon. Uh, so we are still in a progress of uh, towards our milestone. What I'm pleased to say is that we successfully developed novel material and cell architecture that have been tested as a tubular cell for two out of the three uh, application areas. So we have very good results when it comes to utilizing this proton ceramic base cell for cracking of ammonia to hydrogen or power and for re reversible steam electrolysis. However, we have been struggling to uh, develop uh, a good configuration for the dehydrogenation of ethane to ethylene, and this is mostly because we need to handle cork and uh, achieve sufficient uh, 
we wanted a redox stable electrode which can be to reactivate the electrode and here we have more uh, technical challenge to find the desired architecture. A good element of this work nonetheless is that the same production platform can be utilized to uh, develop the cell for all these applications which is also nice. An example of the results that we have generated in the project is here. It's a reversible electrolysis testing on uh, tubular cells. When the cell is operated at four bar at 600 Celsius degrees in various ut utilization and various mode of operation. Uh, I'm not going to detail here, but this is this is an example that uh, it's a cell that has been operated for 4000 hours in very mild or drastic uh, uh, operation condition and it was for us to understand a little bit how the cell was responding when we were operating it in fuel cell mode, in electrolysis mode, when we were switching and when we were also increasing, for instance, the steam utilization. Uh, after 4,000 hours, we took down the cells because we needed uh, to see a little bit how it looked like. It was not bad. This is a cross-section view after uh, the 4,000 hours, we are still proceeding with in-depth post-mortem post characterization to see how things are going, but they are not dramatically bad. Um, so we are pretty happy about uh, these results. What I would like also to emphasize is that within this project, we have also increased um, the cell performance by improving our uh, steam electrode and generating what we call our layered electrode, which contributed to uh, improve uh, ISR. Um, another aspect of the project result is that we wanted to establish a multi-scale multiphysic uh, modeling platform, uh, starting from atomistic to process scale. And uh, we are on the path to doing that. I'm showing you here an example where we are uh, being able to link the cell potential to the current, integrating some uh, 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 atomistic scale and the electrochemistry. And we have done that by uh, working on the development of model electrode. I'm not showing that here and uh, identifying the contribution of each of the um, charge carrier involved in the transport at the electrode electrolyte interface and within the electrolyte by multiplying uh, electrochemical testing in different conditions, different PO2, PH2O, uh, PH2 temperature and pressure. We have applied uh, uh, defect uh, chemistry models and uh, uh, identified the rate expression and the current potential uh, expression for the electrode and the electrolyte respectively, joined them together, did some fit with our experimental data, and you have here now the model that have been generated. The points are the experimental data that we have been measuring in reversible modes uh, at different temperatures. Uh, here it's at three bar. And the lines are our uh, models. Uh, the, you can see there is a pretty good fit uh, within a given temperature windows. The interest of this model is that we are now able to um, vary uh, different parameters. Uh, like uh, the partial pressure, the operating parameters, but also the acceptor dopant concentration or the chemi defect chemistry of the material and try to predict how the, um, the cell is going to respond. We have also carried out mechanical properties uh, testing of our tubu tubular cell because we are um, an argument of using the tubular geometry is that it's has good mechanical properties when we operate in pressure. And uh, we have verified this with our colleague at DTU who have uh, done um, extensive testing of the tubular cells, the half cells, so the electrolyte coated uh, nickel based uh, substrate, uh, in situ measurements, so they did mechanical uh, measurements. Uh, um, at uh, ambient temperature, when the cells were uh, in operation after aging in our mix, after aging in wet our mix, and after aging in a large amount of, uh, of uh, steam. And uh, they found out that within all the operation uh, conditions, the mechanical properties are, of course, evolving as we would expect, but they nonetheless are of uh, very good uh, uh, quality, which 
substantiate uh, the fact that the tubular uh, geometry within the configuration that we have uh, tested there is uh, good for the plan operations. Uh, in terms of exploitation, uh, we are currently uh, working on it. As I said, the project is finishing. Uh, we are um, leveraging the good result that we have obtained for uh, uh, electrolysis and uh, ammonia case. And this leverage uh, has been done by generating new projects. So we have two new European projects that have started this year. Uh, the first one is uh, Protostack, which is on electrolysis. It's going to utilize the system that we have developed in the Gamer project and the knowledge based on material development in Winner to progress further the electrolyzer technology towards the 5 kilowatt demonstrator. And we have another project uh, coordinated by Coorstech, where this time uh, we are focusing on uh, ammonia cracking to compress hydrogen and scaling up the technology to a 10 kilogram hydrogen per day. Yes, that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Marie-Laure, for your presentation. Very interesting. I think now we have, through these presentations, covered all types of electrolyzers. We started with alkaline. We looked at a nine exchange membrane. Then uh, we had um, solid oxide reversible. We had PEM and now proton ceramic. That's, uh, I think, a very interesting sample. Now, I was informed that we can continue this session for another 10 minutes. And I think it would be great if we could uh, take some of the questions that we received in the Slido. And um, there is a question, and okay, it's about uh, membranes. The question is, uh, may I know any uh, European company manufacturing proton exchange membrane replacement alternative, perhaps, to Nafion? And, um, okay, would, I, I thought maybe Antonino, um, since you're dealing with membrane development, maybe you would like to take this one? Yeah, uh, there is a, a, a lot of efforts to replace fluorinated membrane uh, membranes with non-fluorinated membranes. Regarding the uh, protonic environment, there are, uh, in my opinion, some possible solutions. Polyaromatic membranes could be a possible solution. The stability is comparable to fluorinated membranes. Uh, of course, uh, uh, conductivity should be improved. It is not easy to replace the fluorine chemistry with, uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, at the same time in increase conductivity. But uh, I think there is, uh, there is a possible route for that regarding the protonic environment. All right. Thank you. Um, anyone else would like perhaps to comment on um, this one? If uh, not, then um, there is a question for um, Nikolaus Fleischhacker. I'm not sure if you would know the answer because it's a rather specific technical question on the boiler. Uh, in terms of how much time does it take to switch the burner from um, hydrogen to natural gas or vice versa? Well, um, I do. I, that's true. I don't know the exact uh, number, but uh, it's really fast that, that you can switch. Um, basically, it's one burner, but uh, there are two separate uh, nozzles for natural gas and hydrogen, and that's why you also can actually burn both at the same time. Therefore, this is not the main main issue. Actually, the switching. All right, you, you basically yeah change the flow rates and you mm -hmm. go through blends, I guess, until you go 100%. Right, thank you for that. Um, a question to New Eli, Aldo Gago. What was the degradation rate during stack testing? Uh, well, it's a bit difficult to quantify because uh, we have many shutdowns, uh, but in general, we maintain the degradation rate uh, of what was it? Uh, just a moment. Mm. 
Yeah, about 28.7 uh, microvolts per hour. That's 1.4% uh, uh, loss in voltage in, in about 1,000 hours. Right, thank you for this. Um, yeah, okay, That's this is a challenging question. Um, what about pure water uh, and nine exchange membrane electrolysis? Are there any plans in developing um, such type of electrolyzers from any of the three non exchange membrane teams? And what are the challenges there? I think in the Chanel uh, presentation, I saw one graph um, for pure water that didn't look very uh, attractive. Uh, Luis, maybe you want to comment? Yes, the um, TV channel was not the main target as I was in Newly, uh, for example, we tested, but it's an issue related to the ionic conductivity of the membrane. When we are start to be facing issue with the with the kinetics uh, and reactions rate when you move for ion exchange membrane in presence just only the water. So the the huge uh, ohmic contribution that I don't see so far um, as unreliable target to operate the AN right, in right. water. Indeed, you know, the, the type of catalyst you're using uh, with nickel is exactly. quite challenging. Uh, I guess, Antonino, you you would agree with this. Yeah, yeah uh, my, my opinion is that, that uh, KOH recirculation, uh, diluted KOH recirculation is uh, still needed because it is not just a matter of conductivity, but also it is a matter of the uh, reaction order for the oxygen evolution reaction that is uh, linked to the concentration of uh, hydroxide ions. So, uh, and also matter of durability, because of course uh, uh, there is still some uptake of carbon dioxide from the environment, also in a closed in a closed loop. So uh, it, it is uh, important having some recirculation of KOH, replacing KOH time by time. But uh, you know, this is also a similar approach in PEM. In PEM, you need extremely pure water. You need ion exchange resin. You need to, to replace the uh, uh, resin cartridge time by time. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, it is it is always uh, uh, appropriate to operate the system under the best operating conditions, so providing the highest efficiency, the best durability, avoiding uh, uh, increasing cell voltage beyond the cutoff volt, beyond the limit that can enhance uh, increase uh, corrosion. Right, right, indeed. Thank you. And I guess uh, Aldo, you you would be in agreement. You followed the same uh, path in terms of going up to one uh, mole KOH. Yeah, so uh, as you know, Nikos, uh, uh, initially our main goal was operation with pure water, and then we had a risk mitigation strategy that if in the middle we were not achieving our goals, we changed it to KOH. And what we learned is in, in, in pure water, the one of the main degradation mechanisms we observed was the catalyst layer. And well, uh, it needs more time to understand, but it seems that the catalyst layers, they are not at the uh, in, in alkaline environment, such as in PEM. The catalyst layers in PEM are very acidic. So if we're using nickel based materials as catalysts, the, then they, they need to be not in, in pure water because they will corrode but rather in an alkaline environment. And, and this is still a challenge. The ionomer is not providing this uh, alkalinity like Napion does in PEM. Right. Okay. Thank you for this. And uh, a question to for project winner. Uh, what is the efficiency of ammonia cracking with the winner concept? Very good. <laughs> Hundred <laughs> percent? No, 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 no. Uh, it's not gonna be hundred percent, but I'm pretty sure it's above ninety. I don't have the exact uh, value as of now. I'm sorry, uh, but okay. it's uh, it's 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 very good. Above ninety percent. Excellent. 
And I think we have time for a last question for uh, Reflex to um, Mr. Julie Mugian. Um, do you have an estimate of how much the balance of plant cost would increase for a reversible system like the Reflex system compared to a pure electrolysis system? Okay, well, <laughs> um, so uh, of course, in case we have a reversible system like the Reflex one, we have some specific uh, balance of plant components that we don't have in the case of a pure electrolyzer, especially the ones which are needed for the natural gas operation in fuel cell mode. So that's the first point. So that, that there is necessarily a, an extra cost due to, due to this extra uh, Bob components. And in addition, we have also to design some of the BOP components in a different way. I think especially at the heat exchangers that can uh, work in um, fuel cell mode with a lot of uh, thermal um, thermal source to be um, to be to be to be removed. And on the contrary, in electrolysis mode is different. So it means a thermal management that uh, that requires a different sizing and then of course different cost. I am not able to provide quantitative value, of course, but I think uh, maybe with this kind of elements, you can have a good, uh, let's say, overview of what you need to put more. Um, but you can also keep in mind that we can keep quite a lot of balance of plant components that you already have in, uh, in electrolysis mode for this reversible system. And especially if we want to compare with a classical hydrogen chain with a low temperature electrolyzer and low temperature fuel cell that we are, uh, let's say, uh, replacing with the reversible system, then we have a simple solution because we have one single system as compared to two. And from that perspective, the extra cost of the BOP is probably, uh, for, the, for the reversible system, is probably less than if you buy two different systems. I hope it's right. replied to right. some point. That is, I uh, think, quite a, a complete uh, reply. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you very much to all our presenters, panelists, uh, for your presentations, but also, of course, for all the good work you've been doing all these um, years. Um, I would also like to thank the people following this session. And uh, with this wrap up, the session and looking forward to uh, see you all again tomorrow. Thank you all and bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye, bye, everyone.